Welcome to Alpha Bites. I'm your host, Marconi White, and we've got a show hotter than Giselle, an episode of Hot Ones. I'm going to ask for the truth behind Joe Biden's laser eyes, but first, JJ looks for clues for Bitcoin's next move as market liquidity looks drier than the Mojave Desert. Ben Lilly grabs his machete and explores the DeFi jungles in search of ARB. Ray may have found a ray of sunshine in the Tether BTC chart. And King Cody, well, he's going to give us five like it or spike it projects, including PayPal's launch of a stablecoin, Stride, Spark, Seal 911, and Polygon, and much, much more. I've got Ben Lilly, JJ, Ray, and Cody in the studio. Gentlemen, welcome. Very excited to have you here today. We're going to kick it off with the market update. But before we do, our producers have made a change to the all-popular shot clock. And it works like this. During each segment, you will hear two buzzers. The first buzzer is a two-minute warning, and it sounds like this. The final buzzer ends the segment, and it sounds like this. After the final buzzer, we're going to have to move on to the next topic. No matter how much alpha you're sharing, the producers apologize, but that's the way the show goes. All right, let's move on to the market update. JJ, I'm going to turn it over to you. Tell us, where is the market going? Hey, guys. So as we discussed last week, we see the markets currently behaving like a complex adaptive system. So what that means is each time that the Bitcoin's range is threatening to break in one direction or the other, we're kind of seeing the perp market get ahead of itself and add too much leverage and it's consequently getting wiped out. So um, actually, just this morning, we see that there was 150 Bitcoin worth of short squeeze here that just got liquidated on this recent pump up. So yesterday, it looked like Bitcoin was going to break the range to the downside. We had shorts get over anxious and enter position early, and now we see the rebound squeeze. Um, In the meantime, all eyes are on DXY into Thursday's CPI CPI report. Uh, It's currently threatening last week's highs at around 102.70. The key line in the sand there is going to be the 200-day moving average, which is still at 103.48. So that's kind of what I'm looking at. Um, If the CPI report is hot, it could get it over that line, and then obviously... We'd see a lot of uh, liquidity worsen in markets. We see the volatility index has still been creeping up. Uh, we mentioned that last week, the VIX was kind of on a tear, and that tends to front run volatility in the Bitcoin and Ethereum markets. Interestingly enough, Bitcoin and Ethereum volatility are at all time lows. At the same time, we have this huge leg up from VIX in recent weeks. So that paired with the coming CPI, um, it seems like the dollar's at an inflection point on multiple time frames here. So it seems like it's either going to break out above that 103.50 mark or we'll see it flush to new year-to-date lows below 100, which would pave the way for new year-to-date highs for Bitcoin and Ethereum. So very pivotal week here. I'm expecting a huge leg up in volatility come the end of the month into September. And my advice would just be to buckle up. This kind of boring back and forth market isn't going to last forever. It seems like the liquidity in this range has just been dried out. So we should be expecting a pretty decisive move from both DXY and crypto in general to the end of the month. Okay. So we're we're still kind of on the edge of our seats, looking for some kind of movement. I'm I've got it's a coming. Uh, it's it's coming it's coming. Yeah. So you know you, you just mentioned the dollar. Um, I've got the chart up here. It's uh, the Dixie is currently sitting at one hundred two fifty nine. And if I look at some of the headlines here, one reads alarming China data upsets global stock markets, and the next one says dollar jumps on view that U.S. is more economically resilient than Europe or Asia. So going back to the Dixie, I know you're you're kind of agnostic. You just try and look at the data and say well, which way is it going to turn. I feel like you've been warning us for many episodes that the Dixie may have a push all the way up to, let's say, the 115 range at some point before it does a complete reversal. In your mind, are we are we on that point? Is it possible that we're going to start to see a stronger Dixie in the near term? I think there's a lot of fear baked into the Dixie price right now. So I think it's going to take an extraordinarily hot CPI print, which is now the realm of possibility to push it up above that resistance level. Um, So what I'm looking at right now is the monthly chart of the Dixie. And as we see, it broke above 50 RSI in late 2021. So just um, when Bitcoin was hitting all-time highs, we saw a strong reversal in the Dixie. And that drove it up from like the low 90s to up above 114 uh, last year. So that whole uptrend, it was riding above the 50 RSI mark there. Now it's currently resting on that level. So like I said, we're kind of at this inflection point. And either an extremely hot CPI print is going to take it shooting back up above this, or it's going to send it on a breakdown. The last time it broke down was mid-2020, so that sent it from the high 90s to the low 80s, and that really fueled uh, Bitcoin and crypto in general's raging bull market. So that's what I'm saying. Like this, um, The market's been so boring, and everybody's like, oh, yeah, you know, people are saying the move is coming, move is coming. This time, um, high degree of certainty that we're going to see some volatility here one way or the other, because I don't see Dixie's ability to rest in this range lasting much longer. Like it's an abnormal state for it to be in the 100 to 104 range here. It's either going to have to break up or break down. And I think crypto is going to follow that lead and we'll see some pretty wild volatility. That said, I 
think uh, this per punning is just going to continue. So people keep trying to front run the move. I think we're all expecting the range break, but it, it's been pretty hilarious past few weeks. Every time you see the perp market get ahead of itself, there's just been cascading cascading liquidations within a like five percent range. So, so once that's cleared up, we'll be a uh, coast will be clear for the next move out. For the next move out, and, and sort of when you look at the historic volatility charts that you've shared with us. You're saying, uh, and, and these these are relatively short time frames. This looks like this just goes back um, uh, a month or so, maybe even of just a few weeks. But you're saying it looks as though both BTC and Ethereum are sitting at record low volatility, or just more just recent market activity record lows. No record low. So you could look at um the BVOL chart is one of my favorite ones to look at, which is the Bitmex Bitcoin Historical Volatility Index, and that's at ten seventy two. Um, for reference, that's t- it's typically a hundred fall asset, so it's typically trained like the eighty to one hundred twenty range over time with deviations down. And this has just been since twenty twenty two; it's not moved essentially. It's just kind of been in this range, which is extremely abnormal, and it's uh, been so prolonged that people kind of think it's the new normal, which tells me we're about to get a rip that catches um, fall sellers off guard here because it's become an easy money trade. You just sell volatility, sell volatility, you get free yield. Uh, I think that's become a very crowded trade in recent months. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, so I wouldn't bet on those people being aware of um, the correlation between Bitcoin and Dixie and how coil Dixie is right now. Um, and I, I, what I see is the imminence of its range break coming some point after CPI. Okay. If I could jump in, just a quick question for JJ. Is that catalyst coming from traditional finance or global markets based upon what you're saying with the DXY? Uh, in terms of what, like is, is that's what's driving the Dixie price or? So if we sit here and we look at volatility has been so suppressed. We haven't had any of that, that moment that we've kind of been alluding to for what feels like two to three weeks. Now we've kind of brought up volatility and it's coming. Like, what is that moment? You know, you mentioned a few points before uh, some, uh, I forget what reading you mentioned is coming up on the radar here for, for macro data points, but is there anything else that you are kind of looking at that might cause that to, to break open? There could be. So like today, there's been a big sell-off in banks. Um, regional banks in particular are coming under a lot of stress. So maybe that's going to lead to like, if the Dixie goes above, say, 104, we're going to see that dollar milkshake effect for all this liquidity leaves markets. And obviously that puts the banking sector under stress. So if it's falling under stress, there's always um, the chance of a preemptive devaluation to avoid kind of a volatility apocalypse in legacy markets, which I think... Mm the government and federal officials, they want to avoid at all costs, right? So there's the chance that it gets devalued before it really has the chance to blow off into a proper um, dollar milkshake theory end game scenario there. And we would see it devalued. Um, it's just kind of so, wait and see level by level. So almost one market you would be looking at is like, what is the expectation of rates and how is that changing from week to week or yep. day to day even? And what I've noticed too, um, what I track is the 30-day federal funds future for December 2023. And that's actually been moving up slowly, but it's been moving up nonetheless since uh, FOMC earlier this or late last month. So that's interesting, right? Like today, um, now it's up to 94.61, which implies a higher federal funds rate than, or higher terminal rate or lower terminal Mm -hmm. rate, I'm sorry, than there was pre-FOMC. So despite all that rhetoric and whatnot, the market's saying it's not actually going to be higher for longer. Um, the rates have topped out at this point. Mm-hmm. That's what the rates market signaling. So I tend to just kind of trust that yeah. and we'll see what happens. It could always shoot and, down lower. And there was a big move in like the 10, 20, 30 year yields that took place last at the end of last week. And it kind of rubbed up against resistance. And if I kind of see that chart and what you're saying, I'm wondering if, if those rates start to inch higher above that current resistance and start to blow past it, is that going to be that catalyst that kind of ripples throughout the various markets? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Well, one thing I'd like to add before you cut us off is that, so when Dixie had its blow off top last year at 114, what put in the top was the gilt market breaking. And we're seeing a similar setup there possibly with the treasury markets, like Ben was just saying. So that could be something that leads to a dollar devaluation now, as we saw last October. All right. So, you know, what, what comes to mind is I think we need to bring TD back on the show to talk about some of the areas, the potential breaks that he's looking at. Um, he's always putting those in his, uh, his macro kind of views that he, he publishes on Espresso. Yeah, I, I actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna break my own rules, and the producers are gonna hunt me down afterwards. You get you get a one one response to this question: Are we looking for upside or downside? What does your intuition tell you? I think up because I think a lot of fear is priced in. But obviously, if we get an extremely hot CPI report, that goes in the gutter. Okay. But as of now, I think there's a lot of downside priced in already. I think people right. are expecting a hotter than average CPI. So we'll see. 
Okay. So, so the gut, the intuition says up, we will see for all you out there, for all you 499 listeners. That's right. We are one away from 500. I expect one of you out there to, to sub this time. I check in next week and see whether or not JJ's intuition was correct. My sense is that he's right. I'm wrong. Cause I put out my views on Twitter. They were the opposite, but I'm going to go with JJ's views. All right, let's move on to the radar. Ben, you're the one who's hunting down, looking for some yield. Tell us what's on your radar. Yes, sir. Let's dive right into it. And just to be clear, um, <clears throat> ARB is not the token ARB. We're, we're looking at arbitrage. So where's the opportunity right now to generate yield? And the chart that I have on my screen is the amount of validators on the Ethereum network. And ever since Shanghai showed up, I believe that was in May, the amount of validators just skyrocketed. And at the time, the yield that staked ETH was earning was up near 7%. And so a lot of people saw that. They wanted to go ahead and, and get that get that yield. And with Shanghai, the risk to go ahead and stake your ETH was reduced since you could now go ahead and unstake ETH. And the amount of validators since then have been rising. And just really in the past week or so, it started to taper off. So this is kind of that first moment that we've started to see the demand to become a validator on the Ethereum network slow down. And the reasoning behind that likely has to do with the current yield right now for staked ETH. It's been dropping um, really in the past week. It's finally dropped below 4%. So this has been a pretty good, pretty good change here. Now the driving force behind that change is really just the amount of gas being charged on the network. Uh, back in May, you were seeing the amount of GUI or gas fees charged around 20 and above. And now we're kind of floating around on average as 14, kind of below 15 uh, price point for, for each transaction. And so this in turn goes ahead and reduces the amount of ETH that is shared among all the validators. With the validators increasing, everybody's earning a smaller pie and also the fees are starting to dry up as well. And so now you're seeing these, the yield drop to below 4%, which is, I believe the lowest it's been since this has started. Now, what does that mean? Um, <clears throat> so to to try to sum this up, current demand for the network is dropping and everybody's expectation on what yield is going to do is kind of all over the place. And this uncertainty is showing up in Pendle, Pendle Finance. There's price points for what is this yield going to do over time and just for a little background on what Pendle is, you can go ahead and take your staked ETH and lock it up uh, based upon various dates. And whatever that yield is during that time, you can kind of bet against what that's going to happen over time. So if you think the rate, the network activity is going to rise and the amount of yield that that staked ETH is going to earn is going to rise in tandem, you can go ahead and express that uh, bet on Pendle Finance. And so right now you can see these price points are all over the place on that market. Okay, that's a lot of data to digest. So it sounds like you're you're studying this for for our opportunities, but have you really landed on where people can can go right now to see better yield, or is this more just the, the analysis is forming and you're going to continue to look to see if you can draw a conclusion? Yeah. So right now, if we pulled up some of the Pendle markets, you can find various forms of ETH that is staked and and earning that yield. And the way that you can kind of think of um, so they have this asset called PT and that's really like the principle. So right now, let's say you want to lock it up for the expiry is, uh, 2000, December, 2024. And at the end of that expiry, whatever you buy that, that PT amount of staked ETH for matures at that date for one staked ETH. So that means right now you can go ahead and purchase staked ETH at a discount because you're going to go ahead and take on that, that time delay as it starts to mature into that one staked ETH asset. And right now you can go ahead and, and purchase it for 1735 and it's currently trading 1838. So there is a little bit of a discount, but when you compare that to the other forms that you can possibly purchase, so stake frac ETH is 1704. I mentioned the staked ETH is 1735. And then you have swell ETH, which is at 1776. So that variance in price between those three right there is showing the kind of inefficiency that exists in these markets right now. Okay. Now, Ray, I, I want to ask you a quick question here. Are, are you looking at these and thinking to yourself, it's, it's time to get in and get some of those higher rates? Are you, are you looking at this and saying it's time to get out of staking? What, what is your perspective? 
Oh, man, you've opened a can of worms. So in the interest of time preservation, uh, I'll try to be as brief as possible. I am bullish on Ethereum long term, but uh, I am very skeptical and nervous with the whole LSD Fi um, collateralizing staked ETH IOU tokens, rehypothecation, hidden leverage. I feel like this is becoming my like standard words of choice reply to uh, anything related to Ethereum. So um, I- I'm, I'm just not long term bullish on any of this ETH staking stuff until more real world assets come on chain and are a part of the Ethereum staking ecosystem. DeFi as a whole needs to step away from liquid staking derivatives of synthetic IOU tokens. And that entire liquid staking derivative concept needs to be replaced with real world tangible assets that have value and can be fractionalized and do produce yield coming on chain so that the actual tokens are backed by something that has value and uh, and is backed by more than just speculation. Last thing I'll say is the more people that stake to the Ethereum staking contract, the lower the yield goes. And all of these liquid staking derivative platforms are incentivizing liquidity by providing a higher yield, right? So where is this disconnect and how is it resolved where um, actual ETH staking yield is going down yet uh, staking yield, staking providers, liquid staking providers are pressured to provide a higher yield. At what time? At what point does the risk to reward not weigh out anymore? I.e., if I'm only getting like four or five percent staking Ethereum or USDT or whatever in crypto, and I can get that same or higher yield safer elsewhere outside of crypto, or even just leaving my USDC on Coinbase or somewhere like that. Um, so I think this thing is a ticking time bomb and my whole theory is eventually it blows up, ETH price drops below a thousand and that's where people can go like mega long until the next bull market. Okay. That's, that's a good perspective, kind of a counterpoint. Ben, we got about 30 seconds left on this segment. Any, any thoughts there to kind of contrast with what Ray shared? Yeah, there, a lot, but just to keep it concise, um, <laughs> it's yields are coming down and, and really just, you know, kind of not ignoring a lot of the risk that Ray alluded to. We just need to think about what the ramifications are for other protocols. Like MakerDAO was one I was looking at this morning. You can kind of see the the rates for borrowing have dropped uh, over the last month. I would expect those to drop as well. So the cost to borrow, I think, on Ethereum is going to be dropping over the next month or so. And hopefully that starts to spark up uh, some activity for borrowing okay. creation of credit. All right. So I, I, you know, as almost every single topic we bring on, it feels like something that we continue to monitor and interesting counterpoints for all those who are looking at investing or staking kind of the risk reward and whether or not it makes sense to be sitting on the sidelines for the time being uh, with your, with your stables or your cash, or to be actually going in and, and using these pools to earn some yield. I think there's a lot, lot of considerations, but let's move on. Uh, Ray, you've got a chart here. It looks like you're looking at, at Tether, one of our favorites, unless I'm mistaken. Tell us what's on your radar, what are you looking at, and why why is it important? It, it's really just the Bitcoin to USD chart. The standard chart I use is Bitcoin USDT on Binance. Eventually, when Binance blows up or uh, is no longer the leader in like actual Bitcoin trading volumes, I'll have to use some different chart, Bitstamp or Coinbase or something like that, Fidelity or BlackRock uh, USD Bitcoin chart in the future. But yeah, I'm just looking at the Bitcoin daily chart. And for me, higher lows are the way to go. So despite the record low multi-year volatility and Bitcoin price action, Bitcoin continues to make higher lows on the weekly time frame. And this trend hasn't broken on the daily time frame also. So to me, this means that the bullish uptrend remains intact and that certain cohorts of investor continue to view dips um, to lower price support levels as purchasing opportunities. Now, lately, the talk of the town has been the absence of price volatility, um, which I don't really care about. Like the longer that Bitcoin prices sideways, the longer investors who aren't filthy rich have to accumulate without giving into FOMO. So to me, this record low volatility just means that eventually, a sharp directional move is going to occur. But it could also reflect investors' hands-off, let's wait and see sentiment. It could be, um, it could mean that beyond dollar cost averaging, some investors are chasing after the high yields that are offered on bonds, CDs, treasuries, money market accounts, uh, because the term structure in the Bitcoin futures market, it it shows the annualized yield fluctuating between like 5.8% 
to 6.6%, and that's through cash and carry strategies. Um, we're still not in a risk on climate, given all the external factors that currently impact Bitcoin price. So um, seeing the uptrend on the daily chart remain intact is positive to me. Um, awesome. and so you remain uh, bullish d despite some of the, um, I, I guess, some of the, the commentary we had earlier uh, in the conversation just about a potential downside if we see a, a stronger Dixie? You remain bullish? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, if we look back at the Bitcoin daily chart, you can see a near convergence between the MACD and the signal line on the MACD oscillator. Um, on the daily time frame, the relative strength index is hovering slightly above 50. And I think that reflects kind of the neutral balance between bearish and bullish positions right now. Um, if that indicate, if the RSI starts to hike above 50, then perhaps that's a sign that price is beginning to attack the 30 to 32 K zone. Um, that was a nice retest of it too. Um, or like kind of reset itself, right? So things were pretty overbought there early in July, late June. So the RSI falling and then holding that range while price made higher lows is it's very encouraging for a continuation of trend. And yeah, I agree. Uh, my basic simple short-term view is low volatility. If low volatility remains, we don't get a breakout, then we can continue in this crab market until some sort of media headline or SEC action triggers a change in sentiment and then price. Uh, alternatively, a bullish breakout has us kind of close this volume profile gap that you can see on the chart. It extends from 30,600 to 37,500. Um, and a price breakdown, I think, um, could see price drop all the way to 25,000, which is a welcome price. I, I will add a mouthful of corn at that level <laughs> personally, <laughs> but it's, it's not financial advice. Yeah, fair enough. You, you know, I, I did want to ask, we had the round of ETFs coming to market. Again, none of them approved, but uh, a lot of bullish sentiment that legacy financials were opening up and going down the ETF rabbit hole. Then just yesterday, we saw PayPal coming out with a stable coin. Some say that's a watershed moment. I think if you look at it collectively, we had some major bullish impulses, and yet we're still sort of sitting where we are. What do, what do you make of that? The fact that we've had these massive moments and yet we're still not seeing a, a major impulse higher. News events always impact price in the short term, but if there's like 10 ETF applications waiting to have a decision on, it's also a reflection that client money and institutional money is just sitting offside right now, just waiting. So I think people tend to underestimate the duration of consolidation. Um, and um, that's, that's basically it, I mean, Consolidation can last a lot longer than anyone expects. Um, and also bear market it doesn't PTSD. surprise me that volatility would drop during consolidation phases. And yeah, people do have PTSD. And it's my belief that the money's sitting off sides waiting on some decisions on all these ETFs. Almost also just reinforces JJ's view too. Just where's that catalyst going to come? Agreed. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Just seems so like it's all the indicators, right now, like the futures markets can fluent, the options market, technical analysis, all the indicators are kind of like converging and suggesting that price should go up. We just can't find the gunpowder or the match to ignite that move. In my view, I think CPI is kind of the last um, catalyst hanging overhead that could send BTC lower. But I think kind of we've been in this range for so long and I, I believe if it was going to break down to the downside, it would have already. I, I still think there's going to be volatility throughout this week, obviously. And if CPI is something um, absurdly beyond expectations, then yeah, we could see a breakdown below 27,000. But I really do think that if it was going to happen, it would have happened already. So I think when you kind of have all this, if you just look at sentiment, like scroll your Twitter and just read kind of the general sentiment there. People aren't bullish. People are uh, nervous. I, I see that yeah. extremely so. And it seems like every time price takes the slightest downturn, uh, even more so, right? Then you start seeing calls for 12K and just, which isn't yeah, out of the realm of yeah. possibility, but it's like, what world are you living in? Like BlackRock just said they're going to announce an ETF and you're waiting for 12K. Maybe it'll happen, oh. but what what uh, probability would you assign to that, right? And I don't think I, people are thinking that way. I think they're very uh, scarred. Right. I mean, also yeah, added, and you know, oh, go ahead, Ben. Just the, uh, you know, open interest has gone sky high in the past like 24 hours. And the last time we saw that paired up with a good change on, the CVD spot was back in June when we went ahead and found a new trading range higher. So that's kind of a nice development taking place on that metric. Yeah. I noticed that too, Ben. There seems to be spot end. 
Herp's kind of moving up together. Producers are going to take you guys off the stage. Gosh, I'm going to have to have a conversation. But Ray, you get the last point on this topic. You got 10 seconds. What's the last point you want to make? Everyone's bullish and waiting for a breakout. And even if it does happen, it doesn't mean that you should go full retard and throw your entire dry powder bag into the market because there's always going to be a pullback. Wouldn't surprise me that after we break out, Binance gets busted by DOJ officially and price collapses to some low that nobody expected. So proceed with caution. Proceed with caution. Proceed with caution. I like that. You know, th- these markets are fascinating because the reason that most people are out of them is that they say they're boring and they're going to go somewhere else. And in fact, this is this sounds like the best time to be here, to be studying, to see what happens. Make your game plans. Be prepared for when things do turn around. I think all of us here would agree we expect that to happen because we're living in mysterious, odd times, both at the macro traditional level as well as, you know, these these markets that are made of the crypto bear market. But there's just a lot to study. So. I, as I say every week, I encourage you to come back, listen to what these guys are sharing, because there's always a, there's more that you can add to your arsenal and your understanding that's going to be that much more impactful when these markets do turn around. All right, guys, let's let's move on to like it or spike it. Cody, you're always quiet in the corner. Are you ready to unleash your like it or spike it segment? Look at, locked and ready. Locked and ready. All right. I love that enthusiasm. OK, let's get started. First one we got here, we got Strides. Adam becomes the second pool by TVL in the Cosmos Dex Osmosis. Like it or spike it? Like it. Guess so. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, so Strides is basically the Lido of Cosmos. It allows you to stake any or like a lot of the, the tokens for Cosmos and get a liquid staking token in return so you can earn yield on your tokens and also use those tokens in in DeFi across Cosmos. And right now it's sitting at $30 million in TVL, which doesn't sound like a lot, but <laughs> it's quite good for, for Cosmos considering that all DeFi over there uh, kind of disappeared overnight. Well, not overnight, I guess it took them like two weeks or so. Um, but yeah. It's one of the nice developments happening in Cosmos land. Right now, it's the first liquid staking solution in Cosmos, and it doesn't look like anyone is going to catch up to them. They have 40, 24 million locked in Atom. It's the second pool, again, as we saw in Osmosis. And I wanted to highlight it as well because it looks like a really, really good buy down here. Like if you're bullish on Cosmos or you want to get some exposure there, it feels like liquid staking solutions is a place that is going to explode over there because up, up until now there wasn't a single solution for it. And STRD, the token for Stride, is sitting at 72 million in market cap. Most of the tokens are already unlocked. And it feels like, as opposed to Lido, you could see some nice returns over there. Because the issue with Lido is that even though it has produced really good returns for investors, it hasn't produced any returns for most people buying it. That's because if you look at the price, it went like it made an all time high in August 2021 at $6. And now it's sitting at around $2. What has happened since then? The market cap back then was 250 million. The market cap now is almost 2 billion. So it went up eight times in market cap, and, but the price is a third. So that means that the investors and VCs and, and the team have been unloading their position and retail hasn't captured any of the upside of, of what might be the most dominant, most important DeFi Lego in, in Ethereum. So it sounds like as, as an investor, there's more potential upside here than there is with, uh, with Lido. And is there anything beyond that in terms of the capabilities or features that you're looking at that, that shows that this is a stronger solution or is it just that it's really on the Cosmos in the Cosmos no, it's ecosystem. basically the same solution, but it doesn't. Lido is not active in Cosmos, um, so Lido has gone bridged to Solana. You can use uh, Lido there. It's not as successful as some other solutions, so maybe that's why they haven't really gone into Cosmos. The other thing is Lido is a protocol. It's just a smart contract on on every chain that it's at. On Cosmos, on the other hand, most um, most protocols are actually zoned or that's how they call it, they are actually blockchains. So Stride, for instance, is just another chain on Cosmos. So it takes a, a whole different uh, set of expertise to okay. develop that. So All it right. feels like, yeah, if Lido were to bridge to Cosmos, it might not be as successful, or maybe they just don't do it. They have enough on their hands on Ethereum. Okay. 
So that's a like it. All right, let's move on to the next one. We got Sparks TVL surges to new highs as the interest rate paid to die holders rises to 8%. Like it or spike it? Like it. Good to hear. So All right, the- explain, explain. <laughs> So Spark is a liquidity market for Maker. It's basically another compound that Maker has released for some of its coins, mainly for DAI. And DAI, uh, you can earn DAI on, sorry, you can earn interest on your DAI via something called the DSR or DAI savings rate, which is funded by the positions that make that DAI, well, that Maker has. So basically, whenever you mint new DAI, you put collateral on Maker, that's mostly ETH and other types of collateral, and you pay some fees on, on that. So Maker gets a cut, but the part of that goes to the DSR or die savings rate and is uh, distributed among die holders. Thing is, to get this die, you need to lock your die in the savings die or S die on Spark. And up until now, they hadn't really had much success attracting capital there because the the interest rate wasn't it just wasn't high enough to track capital so they decided to bump it up to eight percent and just announced it on twitter like hey come here please we need your we, we need your tokens we're gonna give you eight percent in return and it feels like people are responding to it the tvl on spark went from uh less than 100 like around 70 80 million a couple of weeks ago to now 270 million there's uh, like 15 to 20 percent of die locked in as die um and there has been an increase in the in the supply of die like the the total amount of die of, of about like 10 percent from 4.4 billion to almost 5 billion so it definitely feels like they have been able to track the capital that they wanted to and it so doesn't look like it's stopping anytime now yeah anytime Cody, I want to come in here and I do want to move on to the next one. Just real briefly, when you're saying mm-hmm. that they're upping the interest rate, is this sustainable? Yes or no? Yes, because they they are not re- like usually they are not um, paying all the fees from your depositions to to SDI, right? So like as I said, part of the the fees that you pay for minting DAI go to the protocol, and part of it goes to the savings rate. And they decided to move the interest rate. It has. Uh, move some of, more of those fees to, to the die holders just as a temporary measure because they want to attract that capital. Once that capital is there and they, they move the interest rate back down a bit, it's not going to move out as fast. And it's going to also the interest rate is going to go down um, okay. by like not not at the, once at a time, like it's going to go down slowly. So that capital is mostly going to mostly going to stay there. OK, all and right. That's, I think that's it will good. eventually go to like three percent or something. Uh, All right, so it will come down over time, but this is a good incentive mm-hmm. to, to bring it over. Got it. Exactly. All right, let's move on to the next one, which I think is near and dear to many people's hearts <laughs> who've been in this space a while. A group of white hats and auditors create SEAL 911, a security hotline for protocols being hacked. Like it or spike it? Love it. My producers didn't give me a love me button, so you'll have to stick with like it. All right, explain. <laughs> why do you why do you love it? Uh, because it's... It's such a pain for protocols uh, to being hacked and not knowing who to res- who to contact or like if you see a hack happening and you don't know who t- how to contact someone from the protocol. Sometimes they don't even have security people dedicated to it if they are small. Like or uh, people also sleep sometimes. Like if you have one or two security people and they just happen not to be responding, like the whole TVL for a protocol can disappear in in minutes, right? And it's it's a pain to to get people into a war room and get them to look at the at what's happening and like update people on what the issue is and like what the findings up until now are right um so a group of again auditors whitehead security people have created this hotline on telegram in which you you basically just open a chat with the bot and it asks you some of the like a few relevant questions like what protocol you're looking at like what what's the issue um the vulnerability if you if you can know what it is and any relevant links to transactions or addresses that you've seen interacting with interacting with it and that is forwarded to a bunch of um a bunch of people these whiteheads and security people they're coming all over from wintermute polygon paradigm and some auditing firms like peckshield or trail of bits 
and I don't know, it feels like something that has been a long time coming and I'm, I'm really, really glad that they decided to, to, to do this. And yeah, all- I was going to say, it feels like something that should have been here a long time ago. This infrastructure doesn't feel like it's so complex or re- requiring new technologies to be used. It is not, but it's also, no one is paying these people for this, right? Like mm-hmm. it's it, like they, they are choosing to dedicate some of their time and not being rewarded for it probably um, just because the the hacks have been getting so out of hand. And I think as, as a as an industry, we're seeing that like, unless we kind of get our together when it comes to, to security, no one is going to take it seriously. Like no one is going to park serious money unless they have some way of knowing that like it's not going to be stolen Act, from them, yeah. right? Absolutely. No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think the, the industry looking at this as a serious option and coming up with a solution is extremely promising. And hopefully we can see more activity like that outside of just the hacking part, but other things that can be done um, to continue to make the, the industry more robust. So, all right, well, let's let's move on to the next one. Very curious here. Polygon proposes token switch from Matic to Pole. Like it or spike it? Spike it. So this change from Polygon, they are rebranding from Matic to Pole. So second rebranding from them. And they are changing from uh, sidechain slash L2 to a sort of like network of networks that will help scale Ethereum, all of them powered by the Pole token. So they are kind of like adopting the Cosmos vision, but sitting on top slash to the side of Ethereum. Um, it just feels like one other move from them to try to like, I don't know, they, they throw like spaghetti on the wall and hope it sticks. And they throw a bunch of spaghetti, hope something sticks. They have tried to copy the, the, Supernet from Avalanche. Well, Avalanche calls them, how, how was it? Um, also like some, yeah, subnets. They copied that, they called them Matic Supernets. And the Cosmos has interchange security and this like network of blockchains. And now Polygon calls it uh, the third generation native assets and the, I don't know, like the value layer of the internet. It just feels like they have a lot of money and they are trying to make something happen and mostly just copying other teams and they are not seeing the returns that I think they, they they wanted or like the returns that you would expect. They have a lot of really good people, but it, it feels like they are not really landing on any of the so, uh, ideas or like projects that they're trying to Yeah, I was going to say, what I'm hearing is they're followers, not leaders. Yeah, exactly. You, you can copy someone and like provide a better user experience or provide a better like, or just a better marketing or like something that makes you like, shine but mm-hmm. i don't think they are they are accomplishing it like i think it, it will um it will be a f- uh, benefit to their token which they really need because the like a lot of the, the funding that they get is from emitting and selling matic or like uh, awarding matic to developers uh, or to sending matic when they do like this um partnerships with with firms and with protocols and companies and whatnot but you can see that it's taking a toll on the price of the token. Like Matic is down on the year, like compared to every other token. Like it just it doesn't feel like it's possible, but it's actually down since the start of 2023. Um, and every other L1 and major token has gone up like two, yeah. two X at least or something, even Bitcoin. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah I, I can understand your rationale for, for Spike it. Let me, let, let's get to the last one here because I, I want to open this one up to the team after you share your thoughts. PayPal launches a stable coin in partnership with Paxos. Like it or spike it? I like it. So PayPal raising a stable coin, great news. Um, I don't think I'm going to be using them because I like PayPal. Uh, I think they, they are quite handy when it comes to um, when, when it comes to the, the money from their customers. And you can see it also on the code that they deployed. They reserve or they have the capabilities to appropriate any stablecoin that you may hold in PayPal or freeze it, which is not great. Uh, but what is great is that a major financial company is choosing to deploy a stablecoin. And they are choosing Paxos, which I, I for one, really like Paxos. I think it's one of the, the best um, stablecoin solutions out there. It's a shame that they were targeted on their Binance USD. I think they were just targeted because the stablecoin was uh, created by, in partnership with Binance. The other stablecoins that they have launched haven't had any issues. They are re- regulated by in New York. And I don't know. Uh, I think it's a really good solution for stables. 
and yeah, it just feels like a, a what, what's the name? Um, a competitor to circle in a sense. Mm-hmm. Um, not to tether so much because tether is like in the shadows a bit, but definitely a competitor to circle. It will be interesting to see if they can get or like cannibalize on their market cap. And I think it's also a good move for PayPal. I think they need to do something like if you look at again the the um, how the the stock has traded. PayPal is also down on the hey, year. Cody, you're a little uh, faint. You're a little faint. Yeah, if you if you look at the performance of the the stock, it is also down on the year. I don't know how they, they managed to, to do so as well because stocks have been on a tear. If you look at Mastercard, it's basically at all time highs, and it feels like PayPal needs to do something uh, to become relevant again, and this might be it. Yeah, it feels Funny like anecdote about a significant PayPal, movement. Man. JJ, yeah, what what was your perspective on PayPal on this just, news? Uh, so during the Bitcoin or not the Bitcoin, uh, Coinbase ICO, uh, April 2021, I was visiting my wife's family and her uncle is kind of, he's just typical boomer, right? So this guy's telling me how Bitcoin's a scam, this and that. And then he's telling me that his broker just got him to buy pay- PayPal stock. And I believe if you look at this chart, it's like, I don't even know. It's down about 80 or 90% since that point. And it's just been in a slow crawl ever since. So funny, yeah, their stock could definitely use a pump here. So, so this is a, another case of a Trojan horse Bitcoin getting into a trad fi. So, April twenty twenty one, uh, PayPal was at two eighty one, and now it's at sixty three dollars. Oh, ouch! Oof. Ouch. Okay, so it's PayPal sinking to like put AI or the term blockchain or Bitcoin into its kind of name brand recognition with the hope of getting a pump. PayPal's micro strategy strategy, right? Yeah. Mm. I think they just see the tether profits too. Like, what the tether's true? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, there's like its own dollars. sovereign nation, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it is. <laughs> yeah, Ben, yields. I want to ask you what what is your perspective on this news? Uh, it's good for stablecoin diversity to have another option out in the market. I think also it, <clears throat> if there's an opportunity for people to kind of see those methods that PayPal was doing back in the day and kind of freezing assets, customer assets, and they start to use it on the stablecoin similar methods, I think it will be able to attract some of the ethos of kind of what we're all here for and kind of make some of the other stable coins more attractive in general. But one thing I was wanting to look at first because, you know, fed now networks being deployed for federal banking member networks. And I want to see, because I think PayPal uses synchrony and bank on the back end for a lot of their banking needs. And I didn't see either of them listed on the fed now website as one of the early adopters. So I'm wondering if there's going to be a response here from the federal reserve or treasury. We'll see. Yeah, that's definitely something to monitor given the push we see globally for these CBDCs to roll out. How are they going to compete with, I guess you could call it, uh, private private money or private versions of the the stablecoin or the, the CBDC, right? Yeah, it's an unfair marketplace when the government is trying to get into that territory and, you know, public versus private and yeah, all that work. nastiness. We'll see what happens. <laughs> we will definitely see what happens. All right, Cody, thank you for your... Like it or spike it. Um, this was a much more appreciated version since last week. I think it was almost all dislikes and you're spiking everything left and right. So, Ben, I want to move on to you. You published a piece, What Crypto Can Learn from the Corn Economy, which is just kind of a mind opener, if you will, about the way you see this future. And, and I guess I'd like you to just summarize briefly what your thoughts were, what uh, drove you to look at that. And then I've got a question or two to follow up. I think this would be something for all the listeners. If they haven't read it, definitely something to check out. So yeah, again, summarize sort of what your thoughts were and and why you wrote it. Yeah. So first of all, why I wrote it in general was more that my viewpoint, I think, differs from a lot of individuals and projects that I speak to. And and as these conversations, when we start uh, talking to projects that want say to us for look at their token economics and possible token design when we start discussing like what is a token that that conversation almost always takes a long time and for us to meet eye to eye usually takes sometimes two to three hours of just kind of talking about what their project is and what is the intrinsic value of that token so i try to paint this analogy that might help other potential founders and project builders and even investors in general just to really hone in on what is a token. And the way that I use this analogy was try to have individuals view tokens as a yield of the protocol and how you use that protocol kind of in turn defines the value of that yield coming from the protocol itself. So that was really the purpose behind it. Um, Anybody who's been on the team here has heard me preach this for, well, 
well over one, two years by now. So yeah, it was kind of good to get it finally out there. One of the parts of this piece that I found interesting was the notion of price stability because so much of us are attracted to the space because of the high volatility. And you're arguing here, if I'm not mistaken, that price stability should be a feature uh, of of this economy that the token spaces are building out. Is, is that an accurate assessment of, of your thinking here? And if so, w- w- can you expand on that, this notion of stability when it's appropriate and when, it, and when maybe it isn't going to be part of the ecosystem? Yeah, definitely. And the way that we can kind of think of it is, you know, Ethereum is a network and you go ahead and store data and you kind of c- compute using the network to go ahead and run applications. And that way of thinking of an economy in general, like what is it going to take to go ahead and attract an application to the network? If you have a lot of volatility, you're not going to go ahead and invest capital time in your expectation that you're, you will still be there, let's say, in two to three years. And so volatility really needs to be a part of that agenda. And if we go ahead and look at the best analogy that we can use, which would be, a, say, a government, a nation state, they're central bankers and their mandate tends to be price stability, number one. And then the second one tends to be employment. Right. That's the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Federal Reserve's mandates. And the reason being is that if you can go ahead and achieve good price stability from month to month, people can go ahead, allocate capital, invest invest capital in the right way, go ahead, use the currency as a store of value of their wealth, which is a great sink, right? inflationary sink within an economy. And they can go ahead and use that currency for other things to go ahead and operate day to day, go ahead, pay for goods and services, invest long term to go ahead and build a business and provide productive value for really the other citizens of the economy. So we can bring that model to the network and we can see how greater price stability would encourage more productivity, greater growth within, for example, the Ethereum network or Bitcoin network or any other network. It doesn't have to necessarily be a layer one. It's just the easiest way to draw that analogy. Okay. Yeah, I, I would imagine some listeners may be confused because I think of the growth in these environments coming from price appreciation. And when they hear price stability, it sounds like that's muted. Are you, do you think that there's other opportunities for investments in these networks? And that's where the growth would come from rather than just holding a token and looking at appreciate over time? Uh, that's, a t- that's a tough one, but the way I'll kind of address it is kind of in a roundabout manner, which is the way that a lot of this price appreciation takes place is a lot of these projects go ahead and decide what the token supply and the emission rate of a token is going to be over time. And they try to figure out what the user growth rates are going to be over time. The problem is nobody's ever right. And really nobody has really ever been right uh, because no one really expects kind of an inflow and an, kind of an ebb and flow of users over time. And you don't see supply kind of matching up with that ebb and flow. And because of that, you have a lot of price elasticity that shows up and volatility shoots to the upside. And, you know, the project starts to race to try to meet that. And all of a sudden price pulls back and it can't really meet it to the downsides. When thinking about how to help price stability, all we really need to be concerned about is how to reduce that volatility of the upside and downside. And supply is just the first one, right? We can make it more dynamic. We can make it more responsive to new users coming into the ecosystem. And we really haven't seen that to date. I mean, you could even get into like how to expand a balance sheet, how to decrease the balance sheet of an autonomous agent acting within a network. And that would help reduce volatility. There's solutions out there that I don't think we have tested yet. And I would love to encourage individuals to go ahead and explore those possibilities. Fascinating. I, I, for one, find this topic absolutely fascinating. And I know you and I have spoken many a times offline about the the future of the space. Anyone who hasn't read this article, I suggest you read it and maybe read it twice. The first time from the lens of someone who's looking just to invest in the space and make money. The second time is someone who's really thinking about where can this be in 10 to 15, 20 years? Because it's hard to imagine a future of blockchains that doesn't have elements of what Ben is talking about here, at least from my own opinion, you have to have the stability, you have to have the growth. And that's at times counter to what many of us are looking for when we think about our investments in this space. So fascinating article, Ben, I think, are you planning just last question on this one? Are you planning on writing a follow up to this? Or is this going to be a continued series? Yeah, this is going to be a follow up. And it actually might be my theme for it could be for the next year. Eventually, I want to put together a little educational piece uh, that 
because ahead we we can put on exchanging good youtube if that's something that's uh of interest to everybody here i would love to put that together and maybe even go ahead and expand upon kind of these monthly touch points and possibly put a book together i've been wanting to do that forever i just cannot find the time to save the life uh for the life of me <laughs> i can't wait to see a book come out with uh with your avatar and those stone cold eyes i think everyone will want to buy from that <laughs> All right, guys, let's let's uh, let's move on to the last segment we've got here. And we, there's an unspoken rule that we don't discuss politics. But every once in a while, a politician makes his or her way into our world. And that happened over the last week or so when President Biden of the United States put out a coffee mug with his laser eyes. And uh, it's it's a it's a very interesting mug. This reminds us probably of two, three years ago when the Bitcoin maxis were putting laser eyes everywhere. Somehow he's adopted this. And I, I guess I just wanted to ask the team, and again, we're, we're avoiding the political positions of whether you like or dislike a politician. Um, I guess I'm kind of curious, do they, th- I, I want to know what, what you guys think about politicians appropriating from the crypto world. Is this a positive or a negative? JJ, I'm going to start with you. Are you, are you happy to see Biden using laser eyes or not? Uh, I'll, I'll accept any kind of political pandering where we could get it at this point, I think, um, kind of the beauty of the game theory of it is that sooner or later they realize that this is something that's here to stay and if they want to win over voters they have to kind of play to us even if they don't actually uh ingratiate themselves in the culture right so i think it's funny whatever okay all right (laughs) i welcome it all right you welcome it you welcome it cody thoughts i know you're across the pond do we even know if they did it on purpose like maybe they just use it yeah he doesn't know where he is I don't think they are thinking. I think it's just an intern who was like, oh, yeah, like I like Bitcoin. Like, let's put laser eyes on this thing. But I don't think it's a I don't think they're trying to send any messages to crypto people or anything. Oh, OK, so th- this isn't a, a cloaked message to try and get the message out on uh, crypto. All right. So it's just a mistake. It's just for a rogue intern, but it's having fun. A rogue intern. Our means. <laughs> <laughs> Ray, are, are you of this opinion? Do you think this is a, uh, a nothing that, that is just a, a mess up from the intern? Maybe someone on the Biden campaign team is a Bitcoiner and this is their subtle kind of uh, insertion of humor or whatever. They think it'll help the campaign. Um, so I, I don't think it's a concerted effort on Biden to uh, signal that he's into Bitcoin because he's already called us tax cheats and crypto bros. But I'd buy the cup if it wasn't going toward his actual campaign because I like the cup. You like the cup. You like the cup. Yeah, I like it. It's the whole dark Brandon thing. So it's funny. <laughs> That's a good name. That is a good name. Ben, what about you? Uh, laser eyes didn't really work out too well for us. Uh, I believe that kind of marked the top for the markets. I'm curious to see uh, how, how it works out for Biden. But when it comes to seeing that, you know, any attention is in that way is, is good in a meme sort of manner. And well, uh, maybe it's a trial balloon. We'll see if there's a talking point that emerges later. Uh, from this. Okay. Well, I, I'll put my uh, my thoughts in the ring. I'm hopeful that every one of our politicians, not just the ones running for president, perhaps all of them could have laser eye mugs just like this that we could all enjoy. So maybe what we need is for all you interns that are working on any of these administrations, any of these positions, go out there and make the same goof that we see now with the dark Brandon. I think that would be a, a win. And I, I'm with you, JJ. I like the idea of our memes taking over. Own the memes of production. All right, that's... Yeah. <laughs> One thing I'll add is that it does seem kind of inevitable that politician or the presidential debates will feature crypto at some point, right? Like that's going to be a topic of discussion. I, it's pretty wild. It, it kind of seems inevitable. Yes, it is pretty wild uh, given that just, I want to say four or five years ago, uh, the members of the administration were talking about how crypto would be um, done wow. and dusted, never discussed again in a couple of years. And that's clearly not the case. It's all being ratcheted up. So we're winning, right? Can everyone agree we're winning? Yeah, we were never losing. I agree that we're winning. <laughs> it's an, it's inevitable. That's right. I love it. Guys, that's going to do it for this week's show. I'm going to like to thank my guests that I have here. I've got JJ, Ben Lilly, Cody, and Ray. You guys are always bringing something for me to think about and chew on. If you haven't already and you got something very out of the show, uh, maybe a new thought, something to consider, please consider hitting the like and subscribe button. It helps us grow and to reach more people, which is exactly what we want to do with this channel and with the with the content that we're creating here. And uh, if you can't wait until next week's episode, be sure to check out all these guys on Twitter and social media. That's where they're sharing their ideas more frequently, and uh, you can get an update there. For those of you who uh, don't like to be on YouTube, we have our shows on uh, other podcasting forums, and um, 
You can check them out on Apple and on Spotify. Just look for Exchanging Good and we should pop up. No problems. And the last thing I'll add is that this episode was actually recorded twice because our very first version of it, which was intended to be with video, was a bit of a disaster. And I'm not ashamed to admit that because what we're doing here is something special. Uh, we're very excited to bring it to market and it will come to market. But <laughs> as, as everyone here bear can attest us. to and laugh at, what was that, JJ? Bear with us. Bear with us. Yeah, bear with us in the bear market. Uh, we're not quite there, but we're getting close. And so we're excited. You'll start to see more of these video elements being dripped out. Hopefully within the next few weeks, we're actually able to do a full show. And then you can see all the charts, all the graphs, and our very attractive faces and expressions coming out to you live on the video. But we're not there yet. We will be there soon. That's going to do it for this week. If you've got ideas, thoughts, things that we should have covered, put them in the comments. Let us know what you want to hear about. We're always open to hearing new ideas. But until that time, take care. Be safe out there in the crypto markets. Until next week, this is Marconi White signing off.